Hello, and welcome to this panel discussion from Queen's University Belfast and the impact of COVID on our society, and in particular, how it has affected key areas within the Belfast Region City Deal. My name is Professor Emma Flynn, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here at Queen's. In this programme, we'll be looking at the issues of inequality in the era of COVID-19. I'll be asking, are we all in this together? I'm going to be joined by a panel of academic and practitioner experts to answer some of these questions. I'll be joined by Catherine Higgins, who's a reader within Queen's in the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work. She has an established research reputation in the area of substance use and addictive behaviour and programme evaluation and implementation science. She's got a long history of working with external partners within her research. I'm also going to be joined by Gemma Catney, who is a population and social geographer based in the School of Natural and Built Environment here at Queen's. Her research interests include ethnic residential segregation and diversity, ethnic inequalities and internal migration. And in 2019, she was the recipient of the Royal Geographical Society Memorial Award for Outstanding Research in Early Career. Danny Dawling is the Halford Mackinder Professor of Geography in the School of Geography and Environment at the University of Oxford. His work concerns issues of housing, health, employment, education, wealth and poverty. In 2018, he edited Peaked Inequality, Britain's Ticking Time Bond, and in 2020, he published Slow Down, The End of the Great Acceleration and Why It's Good for the Planet, the Economy and Our Lives. I'm also joined by Fintan Hargi. Finton is a project worker with the Market Development Association, which is a central community group in South Belfast. The association's activities range from helping uh, residents with day-to-day -day issues, such as housing repairs and benefits advice, through to large-scale strategic initiatives of redevelopment. I'm also joined by Anne-Marie McClure. Anne-Marie is the chief executive of Start360. Start360 employs 90 staff in eight offices, delivering 27 services across Northern Ireland. And it looks into areas of health, justice and employability, and it works with young people, families and vulnerable adults who are often disengaged from mainstream services and marginalised from their communities. She's a former nurse and she helped set up the charity in 1993. She's pas passionate about making positive change happen and is a big believer in change starts here. So let's go straight over to meet the panel. As we ask, are we really all in this together? And is inequality the primary driver for COVID-19? So I will just say I'd like to, th to welcome all the panel and uh, uh, for giving up their time today and for such an interesting topic of whether or not we are all in this together or whether or not there are uh, points of inequalities in, the w in our response to the pandemic and what will happen in the future. Um, I'd like to start by moving over to Danny and asking him, now you, you've been looking at inequalities within the UK and globally for a long time for your career in academia. And I suppose what we're interested in is, could you give us an overview of what was happening even before the pandemic and what some of the key trends were that we should be focusing on? Yes, uh, it's, been, it's been all my career. My, my career started in the late 80s, uh, drawing maps of the, of the UK. Uh, and I got into inequality because they were just rising and rising and rising, the gaps of people's life chances, life expectancy, how well people did at school, everything. And it just carried on. The inequality has carried on growing in the UK with some small dips, but not much. You could just about see the new Labour government, but to be honest, only just. Uh, such that the, the UK as a whole went from being the second most equal country in Europe, large country, after Sweden by income, when I was a child, we were, the same, we were Scandinavian, we were the second most equal, uh, to being the most unequal of all, all the EU, when it was EU 28, um, but by last year. And, you know, that was an incredible change. Now, other countries worry about inequality, other countries have had inequality rises, not all of them. Uh, the kind of interesting story, or the, the sort of different story to that main, really important story of inequalities are now very large, they're back to where they were in 1936 uh, in, in terms of this country, is that since 2008, since the banking crash, we have often seen inequalities fall slightly in the majority of OECD countries. So there is lots of potential good news out there. Uh, the last time inequality fell... Uh, across rich countries was around the time of the First World War and it wasn't recognised to have fallen until the 1930s. 
So when you're peak, when you're at a peak of inequality, it's it's hard to know. But there was signs. Sadly, uh, the UK was not one of those countries. Um, but now, we don't know. And just to end on, chief executive officers last year took their largest pay cut since the 1960s. These are the highest paid people. And that's last year. And the idea that a single chief executive officer will let themselves take any pay rise whatsoever with COVID is impossible to, to imagine. So I'm hopeful that one aspect of COVID may well be uh, solidifying a move towards greater equality in the future. That's very helpful. So, so Gemma, we've seen, I think, in the um, in the recent times, in terms of uh, some of the issues about whether or not we are all impacted in the same way, that there are certain groups that have been impacted a lot more with COVID. Now, you your research has been looking at um, ethnic mi minorities and uh, different gaps that there may be within those groups. Could you give us an overview of some of the key themes within that area? Yeah, sure. The the uneven health impacts of COVID-19 on BAME, Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups has been reported extensively in the media and received considerable intense academic attention over the last few months. And that's shown some really stark inequalities in terms of the risk of infect becoming infected with COVID-19, of um, suffering from complications, so ending up in hospital and indeed in intensive care, and also for, from dying of the disease as well. And we've seen horrific stories of entire communities being ripped through um, by the virus. What has received less attention, although we're starting to see more attention um, directed towards these areas, are the kind of wider social and economic impacts of the pandemic and of lockdown um, and its aftermath, of course, as well, which um, for anyone researching ethnic inequalities, we expect this to be stark um, in terms of employment and housing and education as well, given longstanding persistent ethnic inequalities in these core areas. So if we take the example of employment, that provides us with a bit of insight into um, these health differentials that I talked about, but also the wider anticipated impacts as well. And we know there are significantly poor labour market opportunities and outcomes for BAME communities. We see significantly higher rates of unemployment, of part-time work, where full-time work is the preferred option, of um, in-work poverty as well. So people who are in employment, but still living in poverty. My own research has shown um, significant occupational segregation into particular types of jobs, low skilled, low paid and low security work as well. Um, we've seen in the news a little bit of a discussion around um, the disproportionate number of BAME people in what we call key worker frontline roles in healthcare, but also more broadly as well. So, for example, in terms of transport, um, who are the bus drivers, the tube drivers, the delivery people as well? These are, again, low paid and insecure, but in terms of COVID-19, high risk work as well. Um, we also know, um, and this has been a persistent trend for decades, that self-employment rates are particularly high for, partic for certain ethnic groups, um, particularly Pakistani, Bangladeshi and Irish traveller men. Um, again, areas of work where there are no safety nets and where um, the pandemic and also lockdown will have most significantly impacted on these groups. So we're thinking a little bit about the wider impacts of, of the pandemic as well in relation to that. Um, and I should say that um, social scientists researching ethnic inequalities are appalled and horrified by what we're seeing in terms of ethnic um, differences in experiences with COVID-19, but actually not particularly surprised. Um, and it's, it's worth underscoring that, that COVID-19 hasn't created these inequalities, but has exacerbated them. And um, the pandemic and lockdown and subsequent um, aftermath will, will, will show that as well. Um, I think a useful analogy might be to think about an alarm clock where we just kept hitting the snooze button and rolling over and going back to sleep. You know, these inequalities were there, um, but COVID-19 has laid these bare. That's that's very, very helpful. And I think later on in the discussion, we'll discuss what potential interventions there could be yeah. within um, to address some of these challenges that you're pointing out. So, Catherine, I mean, we've we've heard about um, ethnicity, but there are other groups as well that potentially may not have been impacted so much in terms of 
the health issues, but by, may well have been impacted about the the, lock, the effects of lockdown. So, so with young young people and children, I mean that's the area that you focused on within your re research and which your centre focuses on. So, have you seen? those inequalities being exacerbated for that group? Well, much as my colleagues have um, already indicated, um, like in Northern Ireland, 19% of our children already live in, in poverty. And the implications for those children and families, even before COVID-19, are significant. So those children or living in, in those households where there's poverty or, or close to it, already live with significant socioeconomic disadvantage. They are more likely to have poorer health than, than children in more affluent um, communities. The lack of household income is, is really a very substantial issue because it pervades so many aspects of the children and young people's lives. Um, more likely to live in, in um, more cramped housing, so housing that maybe if there's large families, they're um, you know, all kind of living in, in accommodation which certainly um, isn't necessarily kind of luxurious for them. And the whole issue around poor educational underachievement has been a pervasive and intractable issue across Northern Ireland. Um, even simple things like lack of uh, access to green outdoor space for, for some of, of the children living there. And the whole kind of food insecurity thing was an issue even prior to any of this happening for, for some of those families. And even in terms of which I'll talk about in a sec, the whole di digital divide f for some of these communities is very significant. So um, if you think about all of those things and that kind of, you know, collection of issues that, that families were already dealing with, COVID-19 has thrown that into even sharper relief, as Fintan will indicate much more articulately than me um, in, in elements of this conversation later on. But certainly when we've gone in to do some work alongside Fintan and colleagues in these communities, um, you, you know, you really do see this digital divide being very, very telling in terms of some of the, the kids who are going to be left behind in terms of their um, educational attainment. It's not just about giving a family an iPad. There are issues about being able to actually access um, uh, the um even having a room to go in and actually access the um you know the online materials maybe from the school maybe not having a printer to, to print them off and maybe people struggling in families where it's not just they're maybe not just homeschooling uh maybe grandchildren but they're trying to deal with other very significant issues in their in, in their own family life maybe suffering from mental health conditions themselves or dealing with other vulnerable adults in, in, in their household so with all of this perfect storm has come together and really challenging very many um, families here uh, in Northern Ireland at the minute. And you are already aware we have immensely high suicide rates in Northern Ireland, in fact the highest in the UK. And we have um, you know, a bit of a mental health crisis around some of our um, young adults. And again, the um, addiction issues, the mental health issues, all of this has been thrown into even sharper relief because of COVID-19. Now that's not to say there aren't fantastic things going on within communities, which again, I'll uh, defer to Fintan to talk about in a while, but it's very important to really outline the very challenging context that already existed, never mind this exacerbation effect of COVID-19. That's very helpful, it's very helpful. So, so Fintan, I think Catherine is, uh, has segued very nicely into your expertise, which is, is not as an academic, but very much as a practitioner who works with local communities and has been analysing some of the challenges that they've been facing again, pre-COVID and then post-COVID. So I suppose, it, what, have, what are the challenges that the community groups that you've been working with, what are they facing? Well, in terms of the community groups, a lot of the groups just run on a shoestring budget. So you know, it's 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 funding for a wage. Rarely you have a rarely you have a project budget along with the wage. You have to go out and you have to source the funding for any project that you're going to run separately. So whenever COVID hit, a lot of the groups were sort of scrambling. Could they get some of the budgets reallocated? Or there was a lot of grants in fairness that opened up, but then the groups were having then to take stock of what was available and then start a grant process application. Um, no one really knew what was going on because you were getting so many mixed messages. In Belfast, you have the local administration at Stormont was maybe giving out one message. A lot of people were then looking to Dublin and, and seeing a different message coming out from Leinster House. And then they were looking across the water and seeing different messages from Scotland and London. So there was a lot of confusion there about what, 
what advice people should follow and then um, where were they getting it from an area like the market then i suppose people were looking at all these different sources of information and then a lot of people just sort of started voting with their feet so even before the lockdown was officially announced in the north a lot of people just kept there was only 40 kids went into school the monday before the lockdown was announced um and i think people were just following the advice on the south um the gaa etc a lot of the community events and community organizations just started cancelling um, their events before the lockdown come into effect in the UK and the North, you would have had, uh, this, that was St. Patrick's Week. So again, St. Patrick's Day was effectively cancelled before any sort of lockdown came into play. Um, and again, that was just people voting with their feet, um, saying what was on in the news. In terms of the communities, then in fairness to Belfast City Council and the Stormont Executive, particularly, particularly the Department for Communities, they went... They went fairly quickly in terms of putting putting budgets in place. In terms of the health stuff, speaking locally, in the market there was a report done on men's health in 2006 and they found that the average life expectancy for a man in the market was 57. Now, when you read through that report, there was a lot of things around like alcohol addiction. The drug addiction thing was a lot smaller and a lot less of concern then in 2006. Suicide isn't mentioned at all. So, as Catherine mentioned, suicide is a massive issue in Belfast. Um, I suppose on average, and I'm, I'm from the market area, I grew up there. I don't remember a suicide in the area before 2008. And then on average, it maybe have at least one a year since then. So, you're talking a population of approximately 2,500 people, just over 700 houses. Um, so, one a year, like it has a big impact. As I say, the, the area itself is 200 years old this year. A lot of the families have been there for you know, generations and generations. So there's a lot of overlap in terms of social networks, family networks, um, friendship groups, etc. So whenever whenever someone dies in an area like that, particularly through suicide, everybody knows a member of the immediate family or everybody know if they don't know that person, they know a member of the immediate family. Um, that sort of highlights the mental health issues that you're dealing with. In terms of the survey we had done previously, Addiction was the big issue that people people identified in that survey and a lack of support around addiction. Um, I suppose the big concern now is things like that, people who were already suffering serious mental health issues. I think while the lockdown was on and the crisis hit, they sort of went into, that, they went into sort of survival mode and a survival instinct. Now as it started to relax and again you're getting all those mixed messages from the different, you know, different government sources across Ireland and across the UK. Um, people aren't really sure which advice they should be following, so you're getting really a whole hodgepodge of responses. If there is those people with serious mental health and addiction issues, they're really just, um, you know, they started the fray with the lockdown fairly early and they're, they're starting to deal with that. And then you're also dealing with issues that are around antisocial behaviour where it's people who, maybe in any other time, they would be good neighbours and they would be able to get on or there would be a tolerance there for someone with addiction issues. If people are cooped up in their houses and they've been cooped up for 12 weeks, the slightest wee thing at this point is starting to irritate them, especially if it's, you know, overcrowding the houses and if you have a series of houses there where issues going on. Um, you're also then dealing with issues, particularly among older people, of a lot of anxiety among some of them and in isolation where you maybe have some older people haven't crossed the door in over 12 weeks. Um, some of them wouldn't have... Some of them, you know, they'll be living on their own and there's maybe some older people again, their families have maybe moved on. So while your neighbours would watch out for them and while they've been getting the support from ourselves and the likes of the church has been good at tanning with them a few times a week, they still haven't really had that day-to-day -day social experience that they usually would have, whether that would be from going to bingo or, you know, going to mass and those types of things. Um, I suppose on that you've also seen the positive side where spontaneously a lot of streets have just started organising their own street bingos a couple of times a week and that's really started bringing people together. In terms of distributing the food packs we had a good upsurge of volunteers and at, at certain points you had too many people looking to, do, looking to do something because of the social distancing. You couldn't really bring everybody out onto the street at once so there was a bit of work for us in terms of trying to coordinate that and the logistics behind it. In terms of the education side, um, we have a, a sure start a nursery school and a primary school locally but based within the market area you would also have just up the road from us on the lower arm on the lower arm road is the irish language medium primary school and a lot of local kids would also go there 
In terms of secondary level education, most kids would go to St. Joseph's College, which is a secondary school. But then you would also have a lot of kids would be dispersed among different uh, different secondary schools throughout Belfast. And then also a few would be going to different grammar schools, um, as well as the Irish Medium School again there. You're seeing different things emerging there. So the likes of the principal of the nursery school is saying that she's basically... Um, you know, they, they were getting the packs out the families for the education. They were getting the they were there's the seesaw up which is used by the schools in terms of coordinating with the families and keeping in touch. She was saying it was really just saying a sort of drop off in participation. Um, where you just weren't really getting any response. The local sure start was slightly different. They were able to get sort of resource packs out of the families and are dealing with younger kids. Um, I suppose that's less intensive as well. Uh so they were dealing with things like um you know, they were able to do sing-along things and coach them with the kids via, via mobile phones and tablets and that type of thing. Um, in terms of the primary school, again, they were sort of getting a mixed response where the families who had been on the ball and encouraging the kids and had been really, you know, tied in with education and had that sort of ethos, they were keeping at it. The kids who were already struggling then were just falling through the cracks and there just wasn't any engagement or any participation. Um, again, the schools are doing their best, but the schools are already massively underfunded. Um, the schools work quite closely with us, but again, there's a massive underfunding there. Um, in terms of work then, again, uh, the market, used to, you're dealing with long historical issues uh, to do with the industrialization of the area in the mid-70s. So the market takes its name from the 14 commercial markets that used to have in and around the area. And that ranged from cattle, f- cattle, uh, pigs through to fruit and veg through to fish markets through to hack second hand variety market type things uh, as well as that then you would have had three bakeries in the area you would have had a whole range of different industries iron works chemical works um you also would have had like uh, a whole shopping precinct in the area um a whole range of different variety variety shops um at one point you had over 50 bars in the area i don't know if it's a bad thing that we lost all those but um in the nineteen seventies, when the when the Belfast was being the whole area was redeveloped, a lot of Belfast was really bulldozed and rebuilt. Uh, they rebuilt the houses in the area, but they took away all the industry. So, as one person, there's a video at the time in nineteen seventy eight, midway through that redevelopment, and one of the residents has said that that they're uh, redeveloping the area, but they're redeveloping it for future decay, and I suppose that's the legacy there that you're dealing with in terms of the the work aspect. So a lot of people who are in work, um, our, our community survey, sorry, it, 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 it found that there was 28% unemployment in the area. And then a lot of people who are in work, you would find, are in sort of lower level service sector jobs. So you'd have a lot of people who were in cleaning jobs, a lot of people working in hospitality and catering. As soon as the lockdown hit, there was the brief period between getting into lockdown and getting in, and Rishi Sunak announcing the you know, the package of support. So you would have had a lot of people in that sort of hospitality sector who were just let off immediately. And for the first week, 10 days, there was really a lot of uncertainty there about will I get paid, how will I get paid, or, you know, how, how are people going to survive, really? I wonder, could we could we move to Anne-Marie and find out how much some of these issues that you've raised, because there's been a lot of issues in terms of educational inequality, um, employment inequality, reliance on food banks. How much of this is true of the rest of Northern Ireland? Because your work covers a, a much broader uh, sort of base, doesn't it, as well? So we, are you hearing and seeing the, the inequalities around impact and uh, addiction and mental health? Yeah, absolutely, across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, no question about it. Uh, I mean, these inequalities, as we've already discussed, uh, existed, but what COVID has done is magnified them. Um, we already know that uh, Northern Ireland, uh, in terms of resource and services, is a postcode lottery. We're, we're also see, seeing that. An example of, of that would be um, when our, uh, some of um, our returning citizens coming from prison into the community got early release. Uh, it, de- it was dependent where they were go- going home to uh, in terms of the packages that were available to them. And that in turn then has, uh, you know, the, the, for many, uh, these are uh, invisible statistics, forgotten statistics. 
uh, when people are returning to the communities that potentially communities do, do not want to embrace them, families that may not want them return, particularly with lockdown in place. And, and I mean, the whole homelessness issue that we have uh, across Northern Ireland as well has been magnified. Um, within that context, uh, is, yeah, the, uh, I think um, uh, we've already alluded to, uh, Fenton alluded to the honeymoon period uh, where, where people very quickly um, got into lockdown and, and into a sense of um, focus on, on COVID uh, and not in relationships and, and what may happen in the future. We've certainly gone through that. We've seen that across the province as well. Mental health would be one of the primary issues um, that, that we would see with young people and with our adults. Um, also increase in domestic violence is apparent. Um, the digital capacity major issue um, for some of the most vulnerable um, of our service users, we have lost contact with them. Uh, and that, that is down to the fact that they just don't have the access um, and again, that, that yeah, you know, that would be uh, similar, uh, but more, more magnified in the more rural areas where, again, uh, broadband is not freely available in Northern Ireland. Uh, and in the 21st century, you know, that is a major uh, inequality. Um, the, uh, the other issue that um, our staff are coming across is, um, although our services in the main are universal, that means anybody can be referred into them uh, as, as, you, as you would expect. They would be targeted to those that uh, are, are, are more likely to be dis disadvantaged. Uh, what you're finding is that they're living in, in, in smaller homes. Um, they, um, it's very difficult for them to engage in therapeutic interventions, even remotely, uh, because of the lack of confidentiality within the home. Um, what we're finding too is that when we are working with individual uh, child or young person, we're also now supporting uh, their, their family. Um, and, and, and that's well and good, but that again takes away um, the focus of the, of the service user who was uh, referred in the first instance into the service. Uh, the, the, that certainly has been something that we've seen a lot of. Um, in, in terms of services that are available, um, uh, there are some positives, I think, that to, to be identified. Uh, the collaboration between um, uh, our sector with the community sector and, and the public sector has been at an all-time high. We've been working with the community sector in, in all, um, right across uh, Northern Ireland, assisting the delivery of food uh, packages. Um, and from the point of view of the public service, we've had a uh, uh, access then to uh, assist families in deep distress or individuals in deep distress. An example of great collaboration has been with the PSNI in terms of those individuals that have activated their end of life plan and working with them in a crisis situation, uh, being able to engage with that individual and support them and actually going out, not face to face, but through, you know, with the car, through car windows and actually, you know, um, uh, uh, with the collaborative approach, um, which uh, I, I mean, I have to say is unusual. I mean, we talk about collaboration in Northern Ireland. We do not practice it. And it's been really positive to see the potential of that really developing between the, the, uh, the very important sectors, the public sector, the community sector, and, and our own sector, the voluntary sector. So um, that's certainly something uh, of note. Um, other positives is, and, and, and we run two employability programs, one of which does um, uh, have quite a lot of um, uh, BAEM um, uh, 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 young people um, and our attrition rates are, are the lowest ever our retention rates are high uh, and I mean they're, I have to say that's down to the skills within our staff team you know who are from the helping professions youth work social work teaching nursing um, and, and, and have been able to engage at that level and, and used remote working to and, and I mean hopefully that will move forward into blended but 
I mean, even yesterday, staff were saying, you know, there is, we have to, we need to see, we need to start re-engaging with our, 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 our service users face to face again. Some of them are very near, as Fenton was alluding to, you know, really um, finding lockdown that, uh, and uh, easement is very important. And I mean, uh, and I know the government is, is trying very hard to, to ease us out of this. Um, but there is a, a deep fear among people um, of COVID. Um, so it's actually managing those anxieties. And even from a, an organisational point of view, um, within staff, staff have been dealing with this in a whole lot of different ways. Some some have concerned me because they too, um, you know, come come from um, families that that many of our staff are quite young, you know, are living in their first home and have very young very young children. So they have all of the added stresses of, of homeschooling. Um, uh, delivering to care to vulnerable adults within their own families and then also dealing with the particular uh, and peculiar needs of um of, of our service users uh, and and some actually have are using their cars as their offices uh, to, to to maintain confidentiality and, and also get headspace for themselves and of course that cannot continue um, so we are we have now um our own covid um, 19 action plan to move very quickly into step three which is where we would be phasing back into the workplace and to face to face um that's been that's that's really very very helpful i mean i think it's great that you've also highlighted some of the positives because i think there is a situation where we can i think there is you know that there's a lot of clear evidence now that inequalities have been exacerbated, especially in the short term. We've heard about food parcels, we've heard about the impact of not being able to find space and resources to get online to be able to do what you want to do, uh, employment insecurity. Uh, so, so I'd like to open the question out to everybody to ask, um, we've talked about short term issues. What about medium to long term issues? I mean, none of us can read the future. I think if there's anything that's happened, this pandemic has shown that we and there is no such thing as certainty around anything because the world has sort of been thrown upside down a little bit. So what would you predict in terms of the inequalities that you are witnessing within your work, um, either as, a, as an academic or as a practitioner? And are there interventions that you would like to see in place to be able to help close some of those inequality gaps? And I'll open it up to anybody who would like. Fintan, would you like to? We're dealing with like a housing crisis in the area. Um, it was alluded to by Anne-Marie. We are, luckily, we have over 113 homeless families. Um, the issue is that the land is so valuable around us. We have to the north, the Lanyon Place business park, to the south, the Gasworks business park, and then to the east is the Linden Quarter. So they would be the three main commercial office districts in Belfast. So any piece of land in and around us is constantly being snapped up for commercial speculation. Uh, at the minute then, like there's that issue with housing, 113 homeless families, as I say, there was one of those families was in touch with me. It's a woman who is in her mid-twenties. She's currently forced during lockdown to live in, go back into her mummy's house. So she's living there with, in the three bedrooms, her, her mother, her 21-year-old sister, and her two kids, a seven-year-old girl and a newborn boy. The mother has serious, serious addiction issues, has, has had for decades at this point so she's saying like in terms of the mental health and the impact that's having on the overcrowding in the houses you're seeing it uh, the market also then is dissected by Crummock Street so a 27 in Rick's report listed Crummock Street as the ninth most congested road in the UK so we're also dealing with massive issues there around traffic congestion and commuter parking and people parking in it so that pollution factor has a cumulative impact that was also seen in Covid that areas that had high pollution Instances of pollution also had higher sort of cases or, or were more vulnerable to issues around COVID. I'd already mentioned the overdevelopment issue then. Um, 94% of residents in that survey seen overdevelopment and that sort of commercial intensification. That commercial intensification is a threat to the future of the area. Um, we're seeing that re-emerge where in order to get uh, some of the big sort of regional developments through, 
at the Department of Infrastructure relax some of the planning criteria. You're now seeing developers taking advantage of that. So on the gas works, we were already fighting the Homes Now campaign to retain that land for social housing. To the north of the area, we were fighting the Sunshine Not Skyscrapers campaign, which got a bit of news coverage in Belfast a few years ago. We had won a judicial review against the biggest developer in the north who was looking to build a 14-storey building beside the two-storey houses. They're looking to push it back through planning. Um, at this time, while you know everybody's mind's on lockdown, we're trying to get it back through. And then there's been two other commercial plans have went forward into the Belfast City Council planning system in the last few days. So a lot of the residents have now been on to us around those issues and concerned or concern around that. Um, and then it's really just like all these issues taken together, you're just really seeing the lockdown exacerbating and reinforcing the existing inequalities. And then that physical aid and the physical development of the area really underpins all those inequalities together. Um, I suppose as a, as a silver lining, there was a dramatic headline the other day in the Financial Times that a bloodbath awaits commercial property investors. So maybe hoping that that will be it. Uh, can, I, can I jump in? Um perhaps, um, and say that, you know, we've all talked about the unpredictable future with regard to the whole kind of COVID-19 sort of space moving forward. And I suppose as social scientists, that's why we have been engaging with Anne-Marie and Fintan and different colleagues to, th to sort of properly document exactly what's happening so that we can learn lessons. Should there be a second wave? Should there be another kind of emergency that we can not just learn from, from the perspective of the community we're working with but some very invaluable lessons I think which would have applications to other places and I suppose for that reason that's why we've been trying to work with the likes of Fintan and Amory to try and systematically document what's been happening so that when we come out the other end and you know we're not just leaving them there we're trying to longitudinally track the legacy of some of these issues then for the families within the market area and also the the clients and, and young people and families who Anne-Marie and colleagues engage with through NIADA so I suppose we'll have better answers for you over time in terms of what those um legacy issues are but we're trying to document it robustly and systematically so that we do properly learn. So I suppose Gemma and Danny, is it? I mean, what would you like to see happening to help reduce some of these inequalities in the populations that you've been looking at? I mean, have you seen anything that has been effective elsewhere or any promises that have been made in other countries or for other communities that you think are going to help with the groups that you, you've been looking at? There is a potentially positive way of looking at this. Uh, so... It has, it has made obvious the differences in our societies. Uh, huge numbers of middle class people had no idea what universal credit is, let alone how much it was, until they had to realise that, you know, if the pub they owned was going to go bust, that was what they had to fall back on. Uh, but there is a chance that we could see an increase in equality from this. Uh, it's not as bad as the Second World War, but you have to go back to the Second World War for something which has been as much of a shock. And, and of course, during the Second World War, there was a huge increase in equality during the war and then after the war. Um, this Easter, uh, at least in England, you'll have to tell me whether it's the same in the North, um, school children who needed free school meals were fed throughout the Easter. And now, thanks to a footballer, <laughs> not thanks to the Prime Minister, uh, we can predict that, that children will be fed by the government through summer for the first time uh, ever. It's commonplace in places like Finland to do that. Um, furlough is, is capped at 2500 a month, uh, which is a kind of equaliser. Um, if you're on higher than that, you don't get more than that. Uh, businesses who weren't declaring their tax uh, when they have applied for these emergency loans, it's based on what tax you paid last year. Uh, that's, I think, quite a sweet equaliser. Um, you know, uh, it it's kind of come back and hit them. And I did notice only yesterday and the day before, the biggest building society in the UK, the nationwide, but also the banks have, have removed all their mortgage offers that would lend you more than 85%. Uh, because like Vincent said, that they're, they're now banking on a property crash. Um, that's... And the majority of the wealth in the UK is held in the form of housing. And in, in, inequalities in wealth are higher than income. So if property values fall, that actually is a form of rising equality. 
So, I, th I mean, it all speaks into the levelling up agenda, whether or not that's about economic development or educational, re reducing educational inequalities. And to be fair, this was a... Um, a focus of the government before the pandemic and you know and I think it's going to be yeah. accelerated even, uh, okay. even more now yeah. now you, you could you could but they were talking about leveling up which was bringing everyone up to the GDP level of London you know this is just just fantasy we're going to have a leveling down Boris Johnson prep Boris Johnson's prep school has already announced it is closing in a month forever uh, a large number of private schools in England are closing. They cannot keep going. If you want to, and the reason I say about this is, is, as you probably know, England has more private schools than anywhere else in the whole continent of Europe. You have to go to Chile to find a more unequal country by education. Um, so, at least in terms of England, the inability to afford the private school fees come uh, the autumn by many of the small business people who pay for them you know we're looking at a kind of bloodbath of the private education sector which is the what maintains the inequality in england now i'm not going to talk about the north of ireland and your grammar schools and the rest of it uh, but but whether that particular system will be quite as sustainable as it was in a future where we are probably all going to be a bit poorer um and that's that's i think the interesting question everywhere so i'll stay out of that i'm quite happy just to argue about schools in england um and so on but i think we're going to get a leveling but it's not going to be a leveling up it's going to be a leveling down for people at the top and that isn't necessarily bad it's not even necessarily bad for them um but it's going to be very different uh in the next 10 or 20 years than it could have been and covid happened to happen occur at the time uh, of this change. It may have been unsustainable anyway. Um, we may have faced a huge, we were, we were going into a global recession before this began. Uh, Empire 2.0 would probably have failed. India didn't want to buy anything from us anyway. Um, but this is a kind of short, shorter, sharper shock into the real world of you've got to feed people, you've got to house people. Uh, things have got to work and you have got a magic money tree you've just discovered you've got one but um, but it, 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 it is not something you can carry on shaking forever um, yeah there, there will come a time of reckoning with the economics so yeah I'll shut up that's I, 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 I am partly optimistic I do worry about a second wave but I'm partly optimistic uh, I'll from what I've seen so so far from this. Okay. So, Gemma, are, are you optimistic for the groups that you look at and, and what would you like to see? I think the, the optimism that I would share and the positivity that I'd share with Danny and with others who've spoken is, um, I think, the, the very obvious kindness that has been expressed in various ways throughout lockdown and kind of new ways of coming together often not literally, but, um, you know, in, in kind of um, innovative ways. So we've seen new forms of neighbourliness and charity and um, novel ways of addressing vulnerability. So I think that has been really striking. And in terms of thinking about inequalities and the question of are we all in this together, that's certainly something positive that we could we could say. But in relation to ethnic inequalities, I think it's it's pretty hard to be positive, really. Um, there was an article published in The Guardian, I think it was just yesterday or the last couple of days anyway, um, written by the interim director of the Running Mead Trust, a race, um, race equality think tank, Dr. Zabeda Hack. And she put it, I think, really, really well, saying we may all be weathering the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. I think that's really, really um, important to, to think about. So people talk about post-COVID, but I think it's really important to remember for, for most people, um, this will never be. And, you know, there are already signs of post-traumatic stress in children. A, a children's charity published a report recently showing that, you know, um, that for some children we're in this for the long haul in terms of the mental impacts um, of the of the pandemic, let alone the significant losses in employment and in housing, which we've already talked about. I think in relation to the ethnic group dimension um, of COVID-19 and its aftermath, it's really important when we think towards 
the what next and indeed recommendations, we actually need to think um, historically a little bit and look backwards um, to what caused a lot of these inequalities. Um, and we have to remember that what we're seeing is not race or ethnicity per se, but um, the result of a strongly rooted systemic racism and discrimination um, and then the resultant inequalities and disadvantage that emerge from that. Um, the best way to look at it is almost a causal pathway from systemic racism and discrimination to inequalities to disproportionate impacts, such as in, in the case of COVID-19. And these all reinforce each other in a kind of spiral or a cycle. Um, and we need to understand that in order to fix the problem, because patching up the inequalities in terms of employment and housing are indeed urgent and important, but that will never really um, reduce those inequalities. They will continue to be perpetuated and reinforced and emerge. Um, and that's that's kind of important to think about that sort of structural and institutional um, racism and the fact that we do have a racial hierarchy, a social order that responds to that, including institutions and the way that those are those are dealt with. Um, I think the the Black Lives Matter protests and associated responses. I might be being overly optimistic, but I do think we might have seen at least a hint of a kind of social awakening to some of these issues. Um, and that combined with the uneven impacts of COVID-19 on ethnic minority groups, um, you know, maybe suggest that now will be a time for action. But it would be important to, to bear in mind that historic, um, what, what has shaped those inequalities that we see, but also um, in thinking towards um, future solutions, not to put a disproportionate burden on minority communities. Um, so don't. So it's important to to give the AME groups a voice, but not to um, ask the AME groups to to solve the problem. Actually, so that's just um, thinking and thinking about that question of um, of moving forward and, and how we move out of this. You know. Can I? Uh, can I just say something about that? Or just, uh, just a little story from Oxford, because I'm in Oxford and I grew up in Oxford. Um, and I went to a school in the city uh, where we had a house that was named after Cecil Rhodes. And we got it renamed 30 years ago to Martin Luther King House as school children. Uh, and this is part of this change. Today, this morning before coming on, I had to argue with one head of a college uh, that, yes, it is and was always racist to have the highest statue on the public high street of my city being a white supremacist who murdered hundreds of thousands of people and was a bigot. And we, and this is just white people. We don't have our first black head of house yet. She's coming. Um, but we don't. This is arguments about posh, well-paid white people in the city of Oxford, in my university. Very clever, kind of nice, quite liberal often, who just simply do not understand you cannot have a statue of a racist on the public high street. And, and it is a feeling of something has changed. And, now, and part of the reason why it changed was COVID. Because when people marched in Oxford to that statue twice in the last few weeks, there were no students in the city. All the students had been sent home. There were no students and there were no tourists. The people who marched were local. And the black people at the front of the march were local. And to say, oh, they're just naive... Uh, you know, local people in this city have a good reason not to like the university in many, many ways. But above all else, because it's very snobby. But, you know, that statue. Now, once that changes, and it's been agreed that the statue will go, there's merely words about it, but there's absolutely nowhere it can stay. The only problem is that nobody wants it and it's got to go somewhere. Um, you know, you don't stop there. And this is, like Gemma was saying, this is a conversation largely amongst white people in my town. White people with power and poshness and about the next symbol, the next most embarrassing thing, the next way in which we it's clear to, or should be clear to us that we're behaving. And the fact that we're even having to argue about it shows we've got a problem. You know, it is blatantly obvious. Um, you know, not a single school in the city of Oxford would put up or hold up or keep up a statue of a racist on an outer wall looking out. And so it's also partly the arrogance of our society which comes with the inequality of it which means that people with power and wealth think it's okay to behave in ways that other people don't. And, I, and this changed at the time of this disease, and, and that is interesting. We'll never know what's a coincidence and what wasn't. Um, but I do think 
that without the disease, it would have been easy to have said the protests are posh young Oxford University students, when in fact every single protester lived in the city, was local, and most of them had working class jobs. I'd like to I'd like to open this. Uh, I think there's been some really interesting points raised by everybody, but I'd really like to hear about this idea of the leveling down and and the potential uh, the voices that we may now be hearing from our community. So from Anne Marie and Finton, do you do you feel that? Do you think that that is going to happen in your communities? Do you think these issues are now magnified in the same way that they have been in the Black Lives Matters? Or do you think it's just going to be a perpetuation of what we've seen previously? Um, I certainly would like to think that they will continue and those voices will, will be heard. I mean, an example of that from my point of view is I've had an opportunity to present to the, the health committee on the issues. Um, again, wh whether they will be taken on or not is, uh, is another issue and also had access to the Secretary of State uh, to also raise the issues that we've discussed here. So yes, yeah, so I like to think so, but um, I'm an optimist by default. Uh, however, I mean, we had these issues coming out of both uh, world wars um, and, and yet what we, we tended to do was just move back to, you know, the, 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 the strata of society that we've all become uh, used to um, and play our role within whether we want to or not. Um, from my, my point of view in Northern Ireland, and this is an optimistic view, is that with um, the Brexit issue still unresolved, um, I, I think there is the potential for Northern Ireland within where it sits within uh, the British Isles to have a very favourable outcome economically if, if, if we, we are minded to. Uh, and that will then result in, in Northern Ireland being um, a, 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 a somewhere which may come out COVID be a very good good place to live. However, before that could actually happen, we need to look at the infrastructure, and I think that has been magnified. I mean, the um, RPA w w did not work within uh, Northern Ireland. All we did was replace so many chief executives with another tranche of six chief executives. We've got 11, 11, 11 councils, five um, health and social care trusts. We've got a PHA, we've got a health and social care uh, board. We, we've got all of this. All, and, and, and the debacle we're going through now with RQIA and the care homes is example of, of the, 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 the space is just too crowded for um, a sense of good uh, collaboration and, and, and uh, streamlined services to exist. And that's not just in the health sector, it's, you know, you've already mentioned, Danny, our school system. And there's a whole, there's a whole lot of stuff in Northern Ireland we prefer not to talk about. Um, and uh, I, I think hopefully uh, with COVID, again, uh, that has been magnified. You know, the lack of um, uh, joint commissioning uh, across our departments, the lack of coordination uh, within our departments and, and across our departments is, is obvious. And, and the other thing is then just to speak up for the voluntary community sector. I mean, a lot of uh, voluntary community sectors are, you know, really just uh, at extreme risk here in Northern Ireland. And um, some of us have been very fortunate through the funding streams that we have that that that, that we that we are involved in. Um, uh, and, and certainly from Start 360's point of view, we we um, procure our services through contracts. So therefore, we, we are delivering public services. And, and to be fair to the public sector, they have supported us and extended those contracts, which were all due to be procured during this period. However, that is not the case for the majority of voluntary and community sector organisations, and particularly those that moved into social enterprise. And social enterprise was a way uh, which our organisations move forward to within uh, to become more financially secure and independent, but they have not got the support the private sector has has got. This. So, so there's been a whole lot of gaps in, in, in the community and voluntary sector, particularly those that are involved in social enterprise have fallen within those. Fenton has already mentioned the issues around funding for some of the community sector. So, um, and all of these uh, issues have been raised with departments and they they are doing their best of what they've got but there will be major casualties and that then will impact 
uh, on post-COVID because those services that many of the disadvantaged people within Northern Ireland rely on within their community and then the regional voluntary sector um, will not be there. Fintan, are you uh, pessimistic, optimistic, and, and what can we do to put in place to make you optimistic? What would you like to see if you are pessimistic? Pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will, type thing. <laughs> um, no, well, you're hoping that you're, see you're maybe seeing a paradigm shift in terms of even the public discourse. So, you know, Owen Jones done the book Chavs about 10 years ago and it talked about that demonization of the working class. Now all those people who were looked down upon as, you know, low status, low wage workers are now your essential workers on the front line. They're the people who kept the place going. Um, Amory was talking about the community and voluntary sector there. I was on a call with uh, one of the party leaders in Belfast City Council last week, and he had said the same thing, that hitherto the community and voluntary sector here was sort of dismissed as the third sector, and they maybe do some nice wee things off to the side, but nobody really takes an interest. In his words, they very, they very much demonstrated that the, the first sector in the society. Um, they were the people at the front line, they were the people who had given the support when, you know, people in the high paid jobs were sitting in the house out in the suburb somewhere. Um, again, you're here, not within Belfast City Council at least, that it's not going back to business as usual, that it's not just resetting the economic agenda to pre-COVID and that they're now looking to see like how you have community wealth building and all those types of conversations were maybe being pushed at a at a quiet level at council at, at the council or at the city level are now hopefully going to become from front and center and um, they're talking about the city deal and then how communities have a community plan that really puts that at the center of those city deals as well so if there is that type of billion pound investment it's it's the people at the it's the people at the bottom benefit most from it no i think that that's exceptionally interesting i think what we are seeing is a lot of people having a voice because they need to have a voice because we can't leave anybody behind because this is such an all-encompassing issue and uh, such an all-encompassing problem that we need everybody to be working together whether they're official institutions or community groups or or neighborhoods or friends or families to be working together um it's been an exceptionally interesting discussion and we've covered an awful lot of ground and i just want to open it up to see whether or not there is anything that anybody would like to say as a as a final point that they feel that they haven't managed to say to now uh, northern ireland is a, a small place with a population of 1.8 million. Uh, it's a, it's, if you can't do it in Northern Ireland, you can't do it anywhere. And I think there uh, are people minded to, you know, um, certainly develop models, um, some of which are based on the Nordic experience, um, which, you know, uh, if, um, if, if, if we get the wind under our wings, um, I think things could be very positive for Northern Ireland. But again, it's about um, ensuring that our politicians um, are actually in line with what is actually happening uh, at the cold face and for more opportunities for the likes of Fintan and myself to influence um, and um, get involved in those conversations, which, to be fair, it, 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 those are happening more regularly now as a result of COVID. Uh, and I mean, I suppose it's up to Fintan and I to ensure that continues as COVID. And Catherine, you wanted to say I, I, I just, just want... wanted to say that really in light of what Anne-Marie said, if we can't do it in Northern Ireland, I think, you know, it's, it's a challenge anywhere. And we as an academic unit within Queen's are very keen to partner communities and organisations like Anne-Marie's to try and actually drive forward that change agenda, which is why we're trying to kind of, you know, ap approach our work moving forward exactly within that sort of more place-based, impactful way. Um, and, and moving forward, you know, m maybe do things here that other places in the world then look onto and say, well, they did that in Northern Ireland. Uh, as somebody yeah. who's moved over to Northern Ireland uh, about 18 months ago, I'll say I absolutely agree. Uh, I've moved over from England to Northern Ireland and the 
the I think I think I love about it is the fact that you, you can almost touch all entities. It's so small that you you know them all, and, the, and there's a community feel within all of those entities. Even if sometimes they don't feel that they're working together, they are talking to each other. There is a dialogue that's going on. They are connected to each other. And I agree with you. It's like a test bed that you, you to try to get things working together. And that's I suppose why one of the reasons why the city deal is so good because it is all of the entities working towards a, a, a really large objective at the end, which is about inclusive economic growth and development within the, not just uh, Belfast, but across the whole of Northern Ireland too. It's been exceptionally interesting. And as I said, incredibly uh, wide ranging. And I just want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, I, um, it's been really, really great. And I just also want to thank to everybody who's listening. So thank you for your time and thank you to the listeners too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.